Hello, podcasters. It's Matt McLaughlin from Living History here. I'm the publisher of Peter Hart's Military History, and I just wanted to send my best wishes to you all at this difficult time. I hope that you're keeping safe and well, and I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Hopefully, in these dark days, that the the humour and the education and the the interest that Peter and Gary bring is hopefully lightening up your day a little bit. Because I certainly know it is. It is for my day. I love hearing their accounts of military history every week and something that's really important to say about this podcast series is that we record these episodes about six weeks in advance so when you listen to upcoming episodes and you hear gary and peter joking around about being in each other's houses uh please understand that that was recorded six weeks ago before the lockdown came into effect so peter and gary are now fully complying with the lockdown requirements and the episodes they're recording from now on they're doing in isolation so just stay safe everyone stay well i hope that you are doing okay and we've all got to stick together in this time and and let's all just keep our fingers crossed that this crisis passes as quick as it possibly can in the meantime here's peter and gary a living history production i'm peter hart and for the last 40 years i've interviewed thousands of veterans about their experience of war Join me on a journey through the pages of history. Welcome to Peter Hart's Military History. Hello and welcome to Peter Hart's Military History. Uh, and I'm, I'm joined here by uh, Gar- Gary Bain. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, it's a week later, but life hasn't changed at all. Here's a bloody dog again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And welcome to my humble abode again. Uh, oh, Janet's geez. starting to worry that you've actually moved in. Yeah, well, the lucky her would be what, <laughs> what Polly would say. No. Well, no, lucky Polly is what Polly would say. <laughs> yeah, that is right. Um, so if you hear any untoward noises, uh, then uh, that uh, that will actually be Gary, not the dog. The dog's as good as gold and, uh, and not prone to farting at all. Um, as I am. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, today we're today we've got we're doing something a bit off the beaten path for for, for both of us. Let's not and we we want to make sure we are two blokes talking about the subject we love, military history. And the way to make it interesting for us is to to try and look at things that we don't always know about that much. And and so for me, this has been an interesting thing because what we're talking about today is the special raiding squadron attack on the Lambadoria battery at Cape Muro di Porco, which is in uh, which is in Sicily. And this took place on the night of the 9th, 10th of July uh, and was part of uh, Operation Husky, the, uh, the, 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 the huge uh, allied invasion of Sicily. And I want to make it quite clear, and this is important. And Gary, I know uh, would I know you agree because you said make sure you say this. <laughs> We're not experts in any way, form, or shape, or this. even shape or form. Oh, <laughs> shape or form. <laughs> um, we just, we. Just, I mean, I've I've found this interesting for a long time because uh, I took I'd, I've taken the army uh, on tours to in fact the one was a joint service group uh, two or three times to the uh, Lambadoria battery and it, it's an amazing place uh, and it, it just it's something that when I was there you, you hear this story and you hear the story about the special raiding squadron and you hear about their leader Major Blair Maine uh, um, I think you'd probably call him Paddy with your uh, over familiarity with people um, and and uh, and it just it just attracted my attention. It was also the scene, and this is a complete non secretary of one of the acts of most grotesque stupidity I've ever witnessed. And this was a naval officer at the time, a lieutenant commander, and a logistics specialist. So a man with a brain the size of a planet. Rob Thompson, that's for you. And um, and this chap was uh, I took him to Gallipoli, and he was uh, he was we were walking up uh, at the we we're on Walker's Ridge, and he saw. Uh, a snaky looking thing and he bent down to pick it up as he as he bent down I don't know why he was bending down to pick it up sign of a big brain and he realised what he was doing and suddenly leapt back and if you leap back on Walker's Ridge there's two things that can happen <laughs> one is you're off the edge <laughs> and the other is you're on certain footing and he twisted his ankle which led to considerable pain and suffering from it as he descended the rest of the way down Walker's Ridge a ridge by the way that I seem to remember from last week where you ducked out of walking down last time due to uh, cowardice wasn't it yeah pretty much <laughs> I'll blame you and um, anyway so what's this got to do with uh, well uh, with the uh, Lambadoria battery well I talk the same chap I'll know him as his code name Nev <laughs> 
I took the same chap with another party to Sicily. We went to the Lambadori Battery, and it's a like very rocky sort of, you know, very rough. And he started telling this story about the last time he'd been with me. And he was acting it all out, you know, and jump. And he, when he came to the point of jumping backwards, he, he, <laughs> he fell over. And guess what he did? I'm imagining he twisted his ankle. <laughs> he did. Oh, never. <laughs> and this is a man who was promoted to commander later on. This is, this is, and it's irrelevant to this story. He was Irish as well, so that just added greatly to the amusement of all. And it was, it was perfect. But that, that is one reason I remember this battery. But the real reason I remember is because of this amazing raid. And this raid was absolutely important because uh, it, the, the, it, it had to be done to uh, to protect the, the 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 main 13 core landings in the Gulf of Noto uh, on the morning of the 10th of July. Now, I think the best place to start is to sort of build up to this because let's set the scene a bit and let's talk about uh, um, Major Main. Um, yeah, I mean, first. Who, who was he? I know absolutely nothing about uh, Major Blair Main. So, who was he? What's his background? Well, uh, a lot of what I know is in uh, Hamish Ross's book uh, um, uh, on, called Paddy Main, and and uh, I, I, you know, and th- there are other books, but I'm not so sure about them. Because this is a, a figure is of myth, you know, uh, and there's a lot of bollocks talked about him. They, they just over egg the pudding. He was a wild bloke. He was often known as Paddy. In his time, I, I don't really, you know. And he was born on the 11th of January, 1915, which if you look at my uh, Facebook page, uh, Gary, which yeah. I know you do, uh, the, the word stalker was used by Matt <laughs> when he described you. Um, but uh, it's the day after my birthday. because <laughs> I was born on the 10th of May, 1915, according no, to... No, you were born on 10th of January. 10th of January. I said May, didn't I? Yeah. I seem to be drunk. Uh, anyway, um, so so um, now he was born. He was a son. Of, he was in a wealthy property owning, owning Protestant type family in New Townards, County Down. I don't know where any of these places are because, like most people, I don't know anything about Ireland at all. Because um, that's the English for you. They they only know small things, uh, that, you know, around the south. He studied law. He was a bright lad, clearly, and studied law at uh, Queen's University, Belfast. And there he was a member of the officers training corps. So you know. And I believe he was also uh, a, a, an accomplished heavyweight boxer and rugby player. Like yourself, but <laughs> not quite heavyweight at the time I boxed. Um, oh, no. but, so a big man, uh, very active, and uh, I think described as an elite sportsman. Didn't he represent his country? He in, did. He played rugby union for both Ireland and uh, and the British Lions. Um, he was uh, over six, about six foot two. People say he was six foot six, but I believe that's a little over the top. I, I don't know. And he weighed in at a, a for you, a modest 17 stone. Uh, so just a few ounces heavier than you uh, at the moment. Uh, and similar height. And s- <laughs> yeah, yes, Gary. <laughs> um, I'd forgotten about your uh, height issues. Um, he, was, um, he, was, he was a handful uh, on, on tour. He was an elite spot. He was a great rugby player. No two ways about it. Um, but he um, he went on a tour of South Africa and he distinguished himself by what could, was described as volatile, dangerous, unpredictable behaviour, particularly when drunk, which was often. Uh, and he he, taught, he used to apparently hang around the, the dock areas and pick fights with people and all sorts of things. And uh, he, he was wild, there's absolutely no doubt about <laughs> it. I wondered about. where you were going with the hanging around <laughs> dock areas. No, uh, that, there is a, there are, yes, oh, we might as well face that one down. To, I have no idea about his sexuality at all. And I think this 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 cult of, of picking on famous people and trying to imagine what their sexuality was, when we have absolutely no bloody idea whatsoever. And I, I, I'd like to say that I, I'm in that, I don't know. And I, what's more, we don't care either. Uh, what's more interesting is what he did and what we know about him or or, or, or what Hamish Ross knows about him, <laughs> to be honest. Um, Although I might start a cult about your sexuality. <laughs> yes, that'd be very kind of you. I'll ask my Polly, she'll tell me. I think it's uh, non-sexual at the moment uh, in that stage of marriage. Um, now... Um, well, so what uh, uh, he uh, he finished at uh, he began a career as a solicitor in about 1939, uh, so just before the war, and then at the outbreak of war, he was commissioned into the Royal Artillery, 
Uh, surprising how many of these special service, given the, the infantry's attitude to the Royal Artillery, how many of the uh, special yeah. service people come from Royal Artillery. And he served with various anti-aircraft units. And of course, how many of them then leave it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear! I was bit. I really like the Royal Artillery, so I was trying to be nice to him. You just undermined it. Um, he, he left it and went to Royal Ulster Rifles in April 1940, and he left them as well and uh, volunteered for Number Eleven Scottish Commander, where he saw uh, action in June 41. Uh, second Lieutenant by then, uh, and he was in the Syria Lebanon com- campaign. Ah, this is all. I mean, I'm reading now. I don't know about this stuff. He then transferred to the Special Air Service, SAS, uh, but it was then known, this is one of those things that's got 8,000 million names, which all the geeks who are fascinated in the Special Air Service know it, the exact details of. Uh, the Long Range Desert Group, the the L Group, the Sausage Group, they've got a million names. Uh, what they were was a very brave bunch of lads who would go on operations behind the German lines and uh, and Maine took a, a big part in this. Um, uh, raiding deep behind uh, desert, the, 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 the lines in the Western Desert, 41, 42. Used to go out in jeeps, you know, uh, ordinary jeeps uh, with guns, obviously. And then they, 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 they partic- he made a particular thing of attacking airfields. Uh, and he had a reputation. He's supposed to have shot, uh, destroyed more air, air, air enemy airplanes, German airplanes, than, than any pilot ever did. Uh, I think this is just... Another made-up statistic. I would prefer to say he was an extremely effective leader of, of these uh, these SAS raids. But still, a very hard drinker. I think there's a, a story. There's lots of stories around him, some of which are obviously clearly not true. Um, but there's a story, for example, that he got drunk and attacked a superior officer. There is, um, and, 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 and I'm not going to go into most of these. Uh, they're, they're in the book, uh, Hamish Ross's book, and he is very... Uh he goes through most of them and proves that. I mean, like he's meant to have been in jail when uh, Sterling, David Sterling, the leader of the SAS, recruited him. But st- the timelines don't match. I think that's been debunked. Hasn't it, it has. And uh, he's meant to have hit Richard Dimbleby. Now, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And who hasn't wanted to do that? <laughs> who hasn't wanted to do any of the Dimbleby fans? <laughs> although they're getting a bit old for it now. But it, it, that, that's a perfectly natural reaction to a, 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 a BBC reporter, in my view. Um and uh, you know, the, but he was a hard drinking man. Uh, now, uh, David Sterling's captured in January forty three, and at that point, the SAS is the uh, first SAS regiment is reorganised, as I understand it. And please don't, <laughs> don't uh, all feedback, uh, positive feedback to me, negative <laughs> feedback to Gary, please on this. You know, if you have anything in detail about the Special Air Service, Gary would love to know more about it. Uh, if you could direct it to him, uh, he was. Um, it was two separate part special raiding squadron the srs and the special boat squadron which was the sbs oh well you are constant i thought i'd caught you you were looking a bit abstract there um main was blair main was uh was appointed to com- command the special raiding squadron which was three troops and a mortar section at three inch mortars and each troop had about seven seventy men and four officers all told about 250 men yeah so forgive me i'm going to take it back if i may he did have disciplinary problems. He did drink heavily. He had uh, been disciplined throughout his career. How on earth was he appointed to a command? Well, because he was good at what he did. And because in the end, and we'll come back to the drinking, he didn't drink when he was on a mission. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I will play that back to you at some point, if you don't mind. And he didn't drink when he when he was... In the days immediately beforehand, um, I think the drink is a problem with Maine, uh, and and it's a recurring theme that will come up through this interview. Uh, interview? What interview? That's from me being the oral historian of the War Museum, isn't it? Uh, but uh, so let, so let, I've got a quote here from Private David Stilly. St- it's a Silito. Uh, special rating squadron. He says, uh, Maine was a born leader. There's no question about that. He led from the front. That is the main thing. And whatever he asked you to do, he could do or had done it himself. That was why he commanded respect. He was truly worshipped by the men. He didn't like bad language and would not tolerate it in his presence. He did not like women. I'm not sure about it. I was very uncomfortable with them. He was a quiet man. <laughs> very gentle and withdrawn and shy of company. 
But when he was in the mess and had a drink or two, he became very boisterous indeed. Next time I'm in trouble with Polly, I'll say, oh, I haven't been drunk. I've just been very boisterous, you know. Um, he was a strict disciplinarian. If you did anything seriously wrong, there's no question of seven days confined to barracks. You went straight back to your unit. The disgrace lay in being kicked out of the special air service. Now, th- there's a lot of contradictions there. I, yeah. I, hard drinking, hard fighting, doesn't like swearing. I mean, well, I suppose that's possibly his Protestant upbringing, but that's such a contradiction. And very quiet, it's a, I think rather like myself, a very quiet individual when sober. A quiet and sensitive in, individual. And like yourself, he had, a, he, and I'm not lying, he had a penchant for reading poetry, which uh, we've explored uh, a little bit during these podcasts and will increasingly do so. And yes, that was a threat. <laughs> I think it's a threat to the listeners more than anybody else. But he... Yeah, I think that's where our paths di- di- uh, di- <laughs> diverge on the basis that uh, he drinks and fights and I drink and read poetry. <laughs> so so yes when it, yes the exact opposite in fact so he well, i mean he loads of people talk about him reading uh, uh, poems about about reading uh, highfalutin literature the sort of stuff that i'm gazing at yours i can see uh, well he's an educated man you know he's, he's he is a qualified solicitor he is he is and uh, you know he's you know he's a bit of a loner when sober by 43 he demonstrated a gift for for reading so Whatever he was, he, and this business of leading from the front is very important in elite, elite raiding forces because it, you've got to show that you can do, you, as, as Silito said, you've got to show you can do it too. It's not, I say you chaps, go, go and do that. It Follow me. You know, and it, it's a world of difference. Uh, anyway, so 43, natural gift for raiding. He would weigh up a situation. Uh, he was intuitively brilliant in, in guerrilla tactics. I mean, that's, that's you know. And, and all the while, one thing that was noticeable was he tried to avoid casualties. I would say here, trying to avoid casualties on his own side. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a reputation for uh, causing a lot of casualties to the other side. And this is one of the things that I, I, I'm with uh, Hamish Ross again. I keep mentioning him. That's because he's the main. I've read two or three other books and I didn't like them like I liked his book. Um, the thing is that uh, a lot of the myths about him shooting casual, you know, prisoners out of hand, I think, have not been demonstrated to be true. You know, I, 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 you know as I say, this is, a, this is a podcast between us rather than the last word. And he was incredibly thorough, was he not, in the preparation before a raid? He was. He was. And let's look at how they prepared for this raid. Now, what they're raiding is the thing called the Lambadoria Battery. And that's on a, a sort of a peninsula. I think that Matt will put up a map, and you've got a map in I've front of you. in front of me, yeah. And it's called the C- Cape Muro de Porca, which is, uh, well, funnily enough, looking at you, snout of the pig. And your whole your head is almost exactly the same shape as as the peninsula. See? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, and um, and so that was what he was doing. Now, why? Why? Well, that had three 152 millimeter naval guns. Now, I love this sort of precision. Not 151, not 152 millimeters. And don't you forget it. Uh, so there's three of them, and their range covered the Gulf de Noto. Why does that matter? That's where 13 Corps was landing. And that's uh, uh, 5 Division and 50th Division. Uh, so they're landing there. Massed landings on the morning of the 10th. So why are we invading Sicily at all? Basically, it, it, because the, the, I don't, I, we're going to do a whole podcast on the invasion of Sicily. So I want to sort of leave it there. But basically we're invading it as, as we've got to do something uh, the Russians are fighting nine tenths of the war, and there's a huge row between the Americans who don't really want to get involved in Italy at all. They want to concentrate on the second front, the invasion of uh, Northwest Europe, uh, yeah. through, and the uh, and then the British, who, as usual, think it's better to just fanny about around the edges of things. Uh, and this is Churchill for you, the same as Gallipoli. So he wants, he thinks Sicily, and then he thinks it's an easier route, Italy. And then, uh, yes, I, the dog's growling. That was the mention of Churchill. Uh, 
Yes. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so just got eye in him because he's probably farting, uh, which also Churchill, I believe, can cause in certain animals. Um, so that that's that they have to stop. They have to they have to get this. It's also got three fixed uh, gun emplacements for twenty millimeter Ehrlichans, uh, Ehrlichan style, I would imagine, but they may have been Ehrlichan anti aircraft guns. Uh, now, um, how did he prepare for this? Well, the first thing is that uh, fitness. Fitness, fitness, fitness. He was obsessed with getting his men fit, and he drove them hard. Now, they, it doesn't matter what what leader you are, and I've looked at a couple of others as uh, the, the three commando leader, Durnford, uh, Slater, same thing. They're, they're going to get the men fit, so they get ready for the challenge. And it's not just being ready for the challenge. They've got to have some leeway, so that if things go wrong, they're not at the edge of their... Limit, limits they've got a bit in hand you know uh he does this he he uh, he sent his men on long marches uh they uh, they take the wireless with them 38 wireless and they they practice that continually 100 yards apart because communications is absolutely crucial uh, to identify any hold ups uh they they, they 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 march all night stopping only 10 minutes in the hour uh and main Remember Rugby International, fit as a flea? Uh, he would march up and down the line, from back to front of the line, shouting, faster, faster! I hope he said, you dogs. <laughs> faster, you dogs! But all we have in the records is faster, faster. I would definitely have shouted, faster, you dogs! And then they would have said, "Free dogs are going faster! But that's not in the records. But then history can be fun as well. At least while people aren't dying, which they aren't at this time. And he would monitor... That people's reactions, you know, and people who weren't up to it would be out. Uh, on one occasion, this is appalling, he even gave one troop benzodrine, the uh, amphetamines, to check how they <laughs> reacted compared to the other troop on the same march. Um, I should imagine that went really well. <laughs> <laughs> Slow down those men! <laughs> Anyway, um, he also had a, a very big realistic training exercise. Uh, they went from Suez to the Gulf of Aqaba, can't pronounce it, A-Q-U-A-B-A. And after they had a briefing with proper maps, aerial photos, and, and, and they formulated an attack for an imaginary gun battery at the top of a steep hill, which sort of, you know, and that was defended by some Indian troops. Um, and as they were attacking, you know, it's, it's very similar. And they were the, the plan was to cut the road and then they'd attack up the hill. And it was all going well and they were making a covert approach. So presumably hadn't told the Indian troops what they were doing. Oh, no. no. Well, they, they, no, they, they knew they were coming, but they, they didn't know when and how, you know. Otherwise, yeah. they'd have shot them, remember. Um, and they're coming off quite, Good as, point. quite as a mouse, quite as a mouse up this hill. And then suddenly, <laughs> main stuff. Sides are going too slowly. <laughs> With the result that the Indians all started shooting their blanks and, and all hell broke out into a maze of very light thunder flashes. But they took they took the post, you know. Yeah. Um, and it was a good practice, good practice. Um, um, they practiced climbing cliffs. Uh, with ropes and ladders. But when you see the pictures, they're not cliff cliffs. You know, I don't want you to imagine some sort of a vertical 200 foot high cliff because it's not that's not you know but steep steep they used uh you know still bloody steep yeah if you fell off you'd still hurt them they did a final training exercise against an anti-aircraft battery again near sewers uh this time getting more to what they do so number three troop of the three troops cut the road to the battery i.e preventing reinforcements number one troop provided covering fire and number two two troop made the assault moving along the beach a, a great success you know um, and then, and then came the formal briefing. Now it's at this point that both you and I have enjoyed many, many drinks together, and of course our our benefactor Matt. Uh, that's how I met Matt. Was whilst uh, we'd had a couple of pints, I think it's fair to say. So I think I know where you're going here. There is a suggestion that he briefed his officers whilst completely pissed. Yes, I will run through the pattern of his drinking as revealed to us in another book, which I'm going to be using a lot on this. Uh, this is Peter Davis, SAS Men in the Making. He was one of his uh, his officers in number, oh bugger, two troop, two troop, uh, you, you know, second, young second lieutenant. And he leaves this account of uh, Maine's drinking. I think it's him anyway. Uh, he says this, uh, between uh, 20 hundred hours and 2400 hours, the quiet drinking in his room on his own. Now, that would do for me, four hours drinking. Yeah. Uh, possibly in my heyday, I could have just about managed a bit more. Uh, 2400 to 0300, 
drinking with his friends, particular stalwarts who like to drink. Yep, I see friends getting up for a little bit of a walk around. He's excited by all this talk of drink. Um, Peter Davis calls them the stalwarts. Peter Davis was not one of the stalwarts. Between uh, three o'clock and dawn, <laughs> what he would do is send his stalwarts off, wake every other officer up, and demand they come. And if they didn't come, the door was broken down and they were fetched, dragged and made to sit there with the commanding officer and drink. Now, uh, there's two things I'll say about this. One is that's incredibly funny to people who enjoy a drink. It is, and it's hilarious. It's also madness. This is not the way to behave or go on. And it's in one of those sessions that Davis says uh, <laughs> he briefed them. It was at three o'clock in the morning, you know, <laughs> and they're everyone was pissed and they had this the this, this huge model out <laughs> ridiculous um, so an informal alcohol fuel briefing uh, anyway uh, they did then uh, also Davis what's the, uh, I'm going to quote Davis here Davis says that during operations again it's what I said earlier during actual operations he didn't drink nor immediately beforehand this is in the weeks beforehand they then have a formal briefing aboard the ship they're on which is the Ulster Monarch which is a, a, I think it was a, an old steamer between Ireland and, and uh, well Ulster there's a clue and uh, that island that's near Ireland England or Scotland Oh, well. Well, well. <laughs> the rest of Britain, eh? Uh, so they were on there, and there they had a, a proper, a, a, they had a proper, they had the photo recce photos, they had large scale plans, they had this bloody scale model still, and they poured over it, and all ranks looked at it, at it. You know, the officers had to know it off by heart. Everybody briefed on this, and the plan was this. And I hope Matt will put the plan up. I'm going to send it to him. Uh, the Lambadori battery was some 200 or 300 uh, yards from the cliffs, or, or meters. Because uh, I think if we just treat them as the same, it's all right, isn't it? Yeah. Um, at the southern end of Cape Muro de Porco, and it, this the, the, the whole peninsula was sort of five miles south of Syracuse. Now, Syracuse was a crucial port. Uh, logistics is, as we're often being told, everything in, in this sort of land. You have to have ports, and they had to take... Uh, Syracuse to, 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 to allow the mass unloading of, of all the thousands of tons of supplies that the army needed. So they had to take this. Uh, now, uh, in the meantime, the battery fired directly onto the Evola landing area, which is where, uh, well, Evola and Fontainebleau, which is where uh, respectively 50th Division and 5th Division were landing. Now, in approaching these cliffs from the sea, which is how they were going to do it, uh, there were cliffs about 15 to 20 yards uh, high. Uh, now that doesn't sound a lot when you say it like that. 20 yards, <laughs> length of a cricket pitch. Then you put it on its end. It doesn't look well, from one end of the cricket pitch to another. It looks like bugger all. But if you put it on its end and stand on it and look down. Forgive me, this is sort of resonating. And this may be completely the wrong thing to say here. So please correct me. But we went to Normandy last summer. And we went to Pont Doc, I think sounds fairly similar in terms of the terrain and what was what was expected of the attacking troops yeah i think so i, I i'm not actually sure of the relative height but i have a similar impression of the two places now if you were directly approaching the battery then yeah. the cliffs were, were vertical and often overhung and sometimes overhung badly as uh, opposed to hung over <laughs> As, uh, so, yes, all right. That's a great gag. Well, well rehearsed. Thank you. <laughs> um, but eight hundred yards to the uh, uh, west, uh, there's gaps in the cliffs. They come down in levels. You know, uh, to to uh, to um, to the sea. There's landing places where you can get ashore, and it's a reasonable looking landing site. You know, and. What's great from it is because it's 800 yards away, uh, you're not you're sheltered from the guns. They can't shoot at you. Uh, it's you can scramble up. You it's far enough away not to be heard from the uh, the actual base because there's a guns and then there's a camp immediately behind it and uh, and and there's space to assemble and regroup and you know it and and. Yeah, it's, it's good. The other thing is, there's a road. It, it, it enables you to move just straight forward and cut the road from which any Italian reinforcements would arrive. 
and that was the job of number three troop and that 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 they were to move across across to the road straight from the landing place and take this road uh, uh, and seize the, the Masseria de Mario I'm just having to read that farm buildings now I believe during the landing there was um, uh, I think 69 of 147 gliders ditched in the sea. Why didn't they stop and help those? They see them. We haven't got quite got there yet. I, I, uh, but, but yes, they see them. Uh, but remember, they're on a, they've got to got this road because uh, that the lives of thousands of men are at stake. Two or three, well, dozens of men in the water, thousands of men on the beaches hmm. within range of those guns. So if you delay, so basically they've got to take that their objective, and they cannot stop. To that's help. it. Yes. Sir. Now, um, next to three troop landing are the mortar troop, and their job is to move just inland a bit, set up a position, and provide a lot of mortar fire onto the battery. Uh, number two troop would land and then circle to the north, cross the road, go to the north of the battery, and swing in and cut the attack. That none of that happens. The first troop was to go straight for the battery. Take the camp first and then the battery. Uh, so that's it. Now they set sail on the 5th of July. And um, and they, they didn't at first know whether it was an exercise or not. You know. Uh, and uh, so, it, you know, because secrecy is all important. You can never trust anybody in the services uh, in that way before, you know, you just, it, because someone might say something stupid. Um, it, that's not just service people. I mean, civilians say know, stupid things as well. Uh, on the 9th of July, they're told, and the last day, they can see it, and they know they're getting it. And Peter Davis, second troop, said, uh, our equipment had to be sorted, and the weight of it carefully distributed over our bodies. Weapons had to be cleaned and loaded, grenades primed, and protective coverings made for arms and ammunition to prevent them coming to harm as a result of immersion in seawater. Uh, for this last purpose, for last purpose, many dodges were devised. Oiled ammunition while certain rubber articles designed for a very different purpose were placed over the muzzles of our weapons and our watches. What, what, what? I know, uh, that baffled me. Well, do you know? Right, so it's a prophylactic, and it's still the practice today, as you well know. Oh. With a final checkup uh, and a fit, and fitting our equipment, uh, a final glance at the map and photographs with which we'd been issued, we were at last completely ready for any eventuality. We were even provided with inflatable Mae West life belts, just in case we should have to swim for it. An uncomfortable thought, considering most of us were carrying the best part of eighty pounds weight on our back. It's always eighty pounds. Eighty pounds again. It's yeah. always eighty pounds, whether it be the Somme or the. Mo in fact, the modern soldier I think carries more because of the armour. Mm. Um, now, so that the last hours, Peter Davis is. Is, is suffering not I don't think nerves is right but this is before you go into action people get you know it's you know and he's going far worse than the actual fighting itself is the period immediately preceding the engagement during that time they're waiting the inactivity and the considerable nervous tension would completely occupy our minds and the temptation to spend our time brooding and thinking morbid thoughts was hard to resist it was at times like this the, the, the fear of the unknown would take the strongest hold of us. It was too easy to look at this group of faces we'd come to know so well and let the thought possess us that almost certainly that there that, that, that would be many would not see again after a few days' time. We knew there was a great chance too that we ourselves might be among the unlucky ones who had not returned. We would look at all our intimate personal possessions, our photographs and letters from home as we packed them away and wondered if we'd ever see them again and what would happen to them if we did not come back. This is standard stuff. It's emotional, and it's you know whether it be Australian troops before the light horse before they go over the top of the neck that's been movingly portrayed in many uh, TV and uh, things, or or you're going over the top on the Somme, or 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 you're going into action in Northern Ireland or or Iraq. It, this is this never changes in the sense of you're going into action. You've got to deal with what's going on and what you're feeling and you're surrounded by your friends but somehow you're on your own as well because you've got to deal with it yourself uh, i've never experienced this and i know i know you're in the army but you've never experienced no. it either this is this is real soldiers facing real danger sorry <laughs> me you weren't a real soldier no Are it you? wasn't not in that sense no i was no. a shiny ass yes Sure. Now, uh, on the other hand, he's also very confident. And this is crucial. Remember, all the training, special forces. Why Why are they called special forces? Because they're special. They're special. They're not only trained to be special, but they're told they're special, endlessly special. 
you know, and, and this bit, and he says this, to counteract these very natural fears was a supreme confidence we had in our, our own ability, resulting from our previous thorough training. We knew that we were trained to such a degree of efficiency that we'd be able to take on enemy forces greatly superior to us in number and still win the day. All we hoped and prayed for was a speedy end to this deadly waiting and uncertainty and a normal amount of luck and favourable conditions to allow us to show, and I apologise for his language, but it's of the time, to show these IT bastards exactly where they get off. And that that's, that's it. I mean, you know, that's the confidence that we could never have. I mean, we'd never have that consoling thought before going into action. We'd be just shit scared and wouldn't be able to think, ah, oh, but we're super soldiers. We'd be thinking, ah. Um, now, uh, many of the men were, were seasick. They had to get on the boats next. And this, this is Lieutenant Derek Harrison, also too true. And SRS embark. You know, this is the, the, or the whistleblowing moment almost. Slowly, the head of the column moved forward to where the craft were swinging madly to and fro. These are the assault craft. Uh, from behind it was impossible to see what was happening but I could guess oh, only too easily the long wait while you judged the swing of the craft all right the summoning of sufficient nerve to make the leap the knowledge that one mistake would plunge you weighted with equipment into the boiling seas because it was rough weather uh, Peter Davis says staggering under the weight of my kit and still feeling weak from seasickness people always underestimate the effect of seasickness in these 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 combined operations. I fell into the bottom of the landing craft and after picking myself up, made my way to an appointed seat. I hardly sat down when I heard a splash followed by the shout of, man overboard! God, had one of our chaps fallen in. <coughs> Frantic efforts were made to pull him out. Never mind about him! Get cracking and get those boats away! came the harsh voice of the ship's first officer. The longer we were there, the greater the danger we were in. However, the boats were loaded without further incident and jostling was successful. That's Private Jostling successfully fished out of the water. None the worse for his adventure, save he was soaked, shivering and had lost his rifle. Great, just before he goes mm -hmm. to land on that, you know. Um, Derek Harrison uh, is suffering awfully. He said, we're taking on too much water too fast. What we didn't know was that our bows had been holed by the crashing of our craft against the sides of the parent ship. But all thought of drowning was quickly forgotten in the face of a new peril. In sudden panic, I groped on the floor for the all too inadequate cardboard basin provided by the thoughtful Navy against such an eventuality. I found it sodden and useless. Next thing, I was leaning over the side, wedged between the guns we'd mounted forward, my stomach writhing. In other words, he vomited all over the place, over the side of the ship. The, now, um, there's, a, there's a searchlight going backwards and forwards from the, 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 the battery. Uh, and, and, and there's an air raid going on. And they can hear heavy bombs falling. And this distracts the searchlight. The searchlight doesn't come out to sea, so they're approaching. And then there's an alarm. And this is where... The glider business comes. Now, suddenly as we were creeping in the... This is Peter Davis. Suddenly as we were creeping in the silence of the night, it, it was rudely shattered. Although we were still about 200 yards from the land, the noise seemed to come from right beside us. And sure enough, about 20 yards away, we were able to discern a low black shape, from the top of which torches were flashing and men were shouting. For one awful moment, moment we thought we'd been discovered by an enemy Ebo and firmly believed that our last moment had come. But to our relief, we soon realised that the voices were shouting in English. I expect they were swearing. And very violent and unmistakable English it was. They were swearing. <laughs> we heaved to to investigate and found it was one of our gliders which had come down in the sea. One of our boats picked up a few, all too few, remaining survivors. And after this delay, we continued our slow and silent journey. Now, these are the survivors from one of many, many gliders. Now, they'd stopped for a moment and two troop, as a result of stopping, get lost and go out of... They don't land in the right place, probably because of this. The rest ignore them. And there's loads of accounts from both the men in the sea and the thing that they were ignored. Davis's had stopped. They were on Operation Ladbrook and 147 gliders... You know, 69 landed in the sea. Uh, a load landed everywhere else. A very few, only 20 landed in Sicily, and not any of them were near. They were heading for the Ponte Grande Bridge, most of them. Uh, and 252 men drowned in the sea in that. You know, it's terrible. It is terrible. They get ashore, 
Uh, now, Peter Davis realises they're in the wrong place, and he says this, we hit the shore with a slight bump, and from then on, it was only a matter of carrying out, once again, the very thorough landing training we'd gone through so often. After assembling on the beach, by beach, he doesn't mean, you know, he no. mean, we, we made towards the cliffs, which rose up just ahead. Not that they were really cliffs as such, except for a sharp climb out of the boats of about five foot. The shore rose gradually ahead of us in a series of rocky steps and boulders. So the ropes were found to be unnecessary and were able to reach the top without any undue exertion. Now, he is landing uh, about 800... He lands really ju- not far from the uh, the battery. Not He's meant to be 800 yards to the west. He, uh, west, yeah, no, west, west. Sorry, east and west. Huh? Yeah, they were meant to be west. And he doesn't. He lands more, you know, just almost below the battery. And, the, 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 you know, now here... Are they in contact with the uh, first and third trip or at, uh, I'm concerned here how, how are they making sure that they maintain communication well they're not because the, the, the two troop uh, are not the, there's no reference of wireless messages so I find this confusing and and another young officer another young officer was uh, Lieutenant Derek Harrison and he he tells a really different story now there's a there's a website called, called Operation Ladbrook, which has gone into fantastic detail about this. And also there's another book called Stuart McLean, SAS History of the Special Raiding Squadron. And they've worked out between these people that uh, they land... He thinks they landed not far from Davis, really. But Harrison has a... He wrote a book called uh, These Men Are Dangerous. Now, this is interesting because in those days, 1950-something, um, they just made it up. You know, books were heavily fictionalised. And this isn't necessarily people telling lies. It's editors and uh, what you call those ghostwriters improving a story. So this is Harrison's story. In fing- single fire, we began to scale a cliff. I could see neither foothold nor handhold. I felt for them instinctively, hauling myself up inch by inch. My dread of heights had gone. Only once during the climb did it threaten to return. We'd been edging our way along a ledge of rock for some minutes when the ledge was not there anymore. I remember thinking only that I must try another way. I could see nothing. It was as if someone else were guiding my hands and feet. I stretched up above me. The rock was broken but firm. I scrambled up. How long that climb took, I do not know. It could have been 10 minutes or 10 years. At the top, I lay down among the rocks and boulders strewn around. This bears no resemblance to any other account of anybody else on the landings. Now, if he landed to the to the uh, west, east, sorry. If he'd landed to the east where he says he did, then it would have been like that. But the other men in his in his troop and the engineers who were accompanying his troop don't say it was fairly easy so this is just writing up this this thing now the the others that have landed three troop land no problem move ahead take the farmhouse cut the road and and uh, cover a couple of pillboxes grenades into the pillbox stop the way forward so what's happening with the rest of them Where's well, Main at this time? Uh, we don't. He, he doesn't. He's just in charge, and that's interesting because we've talked all about Main. But when you actually get to the thing, he sort of comes back into the story at the end. At this stage, as it so often is, this is the troop commanders who are dominating the action. This is their fight in many ways. Main has set the scene and then comes back into it once the work has done. I don't mean he was hanging back. I just mean that. He's with the headquarters lot. Um, the the mortars start firing, and uh, this is uh, Lieutenant Davis. Mortar bombs are falling fast now. And we're most relieved to realise that they were, were our own. Alec, that's a uh, uh, young second lieutenant, with his uh, mortar section, uh, undelayed by picking up glider survivors, must have arrived some minutes before us, and he lost no time in getting into action. His second bomb was right on the target and set ammunition and grass in the air on fire, so the whole objective was clearly and very conveniently lit up. In every detail. Now, he realizes, and Harrison realizes, they've landed in the wrong place. Second troop were meant to land and then go round and then attack from the north. Well, they can't, can they? Um, and um, you know, um, they can't. So, uh, so, so, what's happening now? Well, the next point is uh, we've got to turn to the Italian perceptor. Uh, and this story, I thought long and hard. I cannot stand people who have a cartoon idea of Italian servicemen. Uh, The Italians had fought brilliantly well in the North African desert. Uh, They'd been badly treated by the Germans and they'd been badly treated by us, but several of their formations had been excellent. And uh, 
But at this point in the war, there's not a lot of point to it. A lot of these are coastal troops. They're, they're, they're actual locals. They're barely more than, than Dad's army in a sense. you know. They're, and they're not keen. Now, this story has a farcical element. This man, Lance Corporal Paolino Carmelo, he's a range finder operator in the fire direct, the direction centre. And I love this story. It, I'm afraid it is funny in a sense. About 21.30 hours, the air raid alarm was given. About 2200 hours, the battery and neighbourhood areas were illuminated by the launch of many flyers, flares. The anti-aircraft batteries had opened fire against enemy aircraft, which flew at low altitude over our battery. Our 20mm machine guns were firing, uh, rapid fire, hitting some of the planes. They always say that. And then my favourite bit, at tw about 2300, the commander of the battery, Pandolfo Antonini, gave Anto Antonino... <laughs> Difficult uh, for me, because I'm an idiot. Gave orders for a possible attack of paratroopers and then started to load his submachine rifle. At this point, he accidentally pulled his trigger and fired a burst that hit me as I was in front of him. I was hit by three bullets, two in the left leg, one passing through the leg and exiting, whereas the other remained in the leg. The third bullet hit me in the left arm and is still there. <laughs> this... It's, it's just a farcical. These are all, what I want you to take from, not that these people are cowards, what I want to take from this is that these are almost untrained. You know, one of the things that the commando troops often talk was about the ability to reload their weapons quickly and efficiently, about the, you know, fire control, that sort of thing. And there is a suggestion that there are women and children in the air raid shelter. They've, they've taken shelter because, the, you know, local houses, there weren't that many houses, but that's what I believe happened. There were women and children in some of the shelters. They were certainly found to be there. Now, uh, the, the, uh, the Private Jack Nixon had been landed a couple of days earlier with a sort of uh, combined operations pilotage party uh, cop. He was actually number three troop. Uh, but he, he, he's got a great quote about an Italian lad. And again, what you notice, don't think harshly of the lad, just think, Nice little lad, can you imagine? I like to think of this as Blue Bowl. <laughs> the poor wee boy was standing ashen-faced and rigidly at attention. Perhaps it was out of terror, surprise, or just sheer luck that he made no challenge to us as we approached him. And the underlying thing of that... There's a shot in. They'd have killed him. Yeah. You know, as echo, but you know, the old goon show. Remember, the goon show was veterans of the, Great, of the Second World War. Yeah. Uh, and people are always getting deadied. And this particular chap would have been deadied. Uh, no doubt about it. Because these people shoot first. And a number of the goons are in the artillery, but they remained there. <laughs> exactly. They remained there, yes. Oh. Um, now, the mortar troop, that's uh, Lieutenant Alex Muirhead, they're pouring the shells in. And uh, <clears throat> where they came up, there's actually steps. You know, the Italians have cut steps in the cliffs down to the beach. Very helpful. Uh, well, they probably did it 300 years ago. The implication is they've done it, the battery people have done it. I'm not sure about that. Now, the mortars firing in. <clears throat> Number one troop is uh, getting ready. Um, they, 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 they take the, uh, they take, they take the, uh, the battery. Uh, well, they take the the camp first, and this is commanded by a tap called John, Johnny Wiseman. Peter Davis doesn't know what's happening, and uh, I like this quote because it's got the usual thing of somebody tearing their clothes. Uh, Peter Davis says, I decided to take my stre section straight in across a section of open ground that separated us from the gun battery. Remember, he's landed nearly opposite, which we could see clearly now, lit up by the flames caused by Alex's extremely accurate mortifier. That's Alex Muirhead. Um, topping a slight rise, we came upon a low, long, low fence of tangled barbed wire. Just ahead of us were some troops, which by their silhouettes we clearly recognised as being our own. I went up to them and discovered that they were Johnny Wiseman's section. Heavens, what a muddle. I got over the wire, because they could have shot them. Yeah. I got over the wire as quickly as I could, with visions of the whole length of it being covered by hidden machine guns and strewn with booby traps. So anxious was I to get across that I left the entire seat of my trousers behind on the wire. as a, <laughs> an ominous tearing sound and the resulting drafty sensation around my nether regions. <laughs> that dog has a drafty sensation around his nether regions. Um, by this time, so one troop have taken the, the camp and they're pouring fire into the battery. Two troop, uh, and they're in bits, they're several bits, uh, Harrison's group, uh, and they're not, they're not really going round to the, the north. They're not really doing anything. Wiseman just, just decides to go it alone. He's captured the camp 
and he goes for it. And John Wiseman says this, the area where the, gun, the, where the guns were had barbed wire around it. I got there first and cut the wire. I thought there might be mines. There weren't. We went through the gap I'd cut. I and my troop, we took the first gun p- without any bother. I shouted to the chaps who were loading it to come out. I wasn't going to go down in the dugout underneath and be the first person in. <laughs> they all came out with their hands up. We took some 40 prisoners without any bother. And then Sergeant Robert Bennett he says, uh, the RAF had done such a good job on the bombardment of the coastal defences that the Italians manning the guns had fled into the ground. When we got to the tunnels beneath the guns, I could hardly believe my eyes. The Italians were cowering in a corner, pl- praying for deliverance. Some were crying and fell to their knees. Others were groveling in sheer terror and fright. They were like helpless children shocked into submission by a terrific non-stop bombardment from the air, which must have lasted for hours. One could feel sorry for them, but there was no time for sentiment. I took what I wanted from them. They, they willingly unstrapped their watches with trembling hands and gave them to me. Others fumbled for bundles of grubber, grubby lira notes, which they pressed into our hands. All they wanted was to be allowed to live and get back to their mummers, reg- regardless of cost or the humiliation. This is quite nasty in a way, but it's fairly standard for troops. Uh, the, the Australians call it ratting. You, you take whatever you can from them. Uh, and... We are more sympathetic to those people down there. Remember, there's women and children taking shelter there. They've been bombed and shelled, and, and they don't feel too good. And they do just want to survive. And it's, you know, and it might seem to these elite super soldiers that these, these untrained people were useless. Well, they were compared to them. Well, and it would be terrifying. It, you know, it would be, you've got the, the bombing from the air raids, and then you're faced with elite troops. It's terrifying, and their behaviours and actions are completely understandable. I think so. And Peter Davis gets there later, and he says, We found them in one troop, busy mopping the place up. The pale light of dawn began to clarify the scene, clarify the scene. and soon we could find, we could distinguish little groups of Italians standing shivering by their nonchalant guards, you know. Um, some of our lads were busy around the entrance to a deep air raid shelter from which certain noises had made themselves heard and after repeated threats and exhortations accompanied by some pretty forceful persuasion through the use of small arms, fire and grenades they succeeded in extracting the occupants. So, you know, people are terrified. If they're terrified to come out when they're, when they're small arms, fire and grenades I don't think there's many people killed in this. I was going to say, what sort of casualties are there for the, the British side? Uh, we... Basically, none at this stage. They do lose a sergeant later. Uh, you know, I mean, we're not losing men. You know, um, Davis uh, saw the prisoners again, and he says they were a sorry sight. The men came out grinning sheepishly, and obviously glad they'd been left alive. Many were considerably shaken, and some wounded. But what took us really by surprise was the fact down in the dugout were also women and children. And then a bit I don't like, but it's understandable, I suppose, in the context of the time. They were a poor lot, dirty, shabby, and ill-equipped ingratiating and fawning they've formed a startling contrast to the mental picture we'd formed of the tough experienced and fanatically patriotic defenders we were expected to come up against but these weren't these people these were coastal defense troops they, they've got no chance they completed the catch by 04 30 in the morning and uh, their charges they blew it up they blew up the whole thing at five o'clock 0500 for you uh, they killed or wounded 50 or 60 Italian soldiers and captured another 50 or 60. I'm not sure about these statistics. Wartime statistics, and I haven't had chance to look properly other than that. Maine then swings into action. And this is where you start seeing Maine again. And Maine concentrates his forces by the farm where number three troops were, Masseria Demirio de, de form. And then actually he finds just two, three more batteries on the uh, peninsula. And he leads his men off. They're not, they don't, they don't aim over the Gulf of Nota, but he decides to take them out. And he leads his men to capture them. Uh, two, three batteries in all moving towards Augusta. Uh, not much resistance, but a couple do get wounded and one sergeant gets killed, you know. Um, it had been a great success. Now, in some ways, people say, well, not much killing and death. Well, it's quite, I'm quite pleased. Very successful. Yeah, it's a successful raid by elite soldiers who've encountered non-elite soldiers. And uh, the Lambadori battery is ki- uh, just taken. And the real importance is, of course, that that means that the landing is not fired at from the flank. So all those landing ships come in. The poor gliders, well, that's just a separate story. It's a just absolute disaster, The uh, you know, and uh, so many of them drown. 
262, I think I said. Uh, so, so, so that's the story of the capture of the Lambadoria battery. And it, I think it's been interesting for us to do something we, we're not that up on, you know. No, and I think, you know, just to make you happy, uh, Paddy Main received um, four DSO, so D- DSO and three bars, and was recommended for a VC, but he never got it. Would you think that's because of his behaviour? or? I mean, he was a clearly very brave man, but I think arguably an alcoholic. And when did he die and how did he die? Well, he... The, 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 I think uh, this is where, I, again, I return to Hamish Ross. Uh, I think it charts a, a, the story of a man who's showing the, the effects of post-traumatic stress. Uh, I think he's put himself through too much. He's gone to the well a lot. Uh, you know, the old gone to the well. Um, he, I'd, I mean, he carries on his distinguished career and he's involved in some amazing raids in, in Northwest, uh, more raids in Sicily than in Northwest Europe. Uh, time and time again. And survives the war. Then. He survives the war, but he doesn't survive the peace, if you know what I mean. He uh, His drinking gets out of hand um, and, uh, and he dies drunk according to the reports, in a car accident in 1955. He'd been drinking at a Masonic view or something such. Uh, he was only 40 years old when he died. He didn't get the VC. Um, I don't think that... I, I'm not that in, enamoured by medals in that way. I, I don't know why he didn't get the VC. Uh, the authorities know why he didn't get the VC, and they're not, they, they don't put it out, do they? Uh, I would imagine his reputation for uh, being difficult... Uh, and some of the stories uh, had got some traction. I don't know whether the stories were true. Most of them were certainly untrue. But I, I should imagine that they just thought, mm, is he the right man to do it with? And I think in, in a, he certainly deserved it. He has become a great hero. Uh, and he, he's, it's not as if he's forgotten. No. And and I think we did someone else, uh, Simpson, John Simpson, Kirk Patrick. Do these people really need a VC to be validated? Do we somehow have to validate them? No, not at all. He's they, clearly a very I, brave man. I think they validate themselves by their achievements. And I think it's been interesting talking about him. Yeah. Thank and you then, very much, Pete. Cheers. <laughs>